Postscript Media, podcast for a changing planet. Happy New Year, Mike. Oh, same to you, Tamar. Happy 2023. And I hope all of our listeners had an excellent holiday season and a great New Year's Eve, and they didn't score as high on the old fart index as I did, because I was in bed by about 11.15. Well, I did a, a little better than you, but let's talk about 2022 was really an amazing year for those of us who care about the food and climate nexus, right? Uh, this stuff that we talk about all the time. Um, it really kind of hit the big time, right? You had these international climate meetings in, in Egypt where for the first time they really addressed the intersection of food and climate. They devoted a whole day to it, really the first time in 27 years. And then in the United States, you had the Inflation Reduction Act, which was not only the biggest climate bill in the history of the world, but was the first to really throw a lot of money, $20 billion, into climate-smart agriculture. You know, it feels like we finally arrived. Yeah, food is on the table, if you will, for both the national and the international conversation. Of course, the biggest food and climate-related event from 2022 was the launch of Climavores. Uh, of course, right? Now, we're, for all of those billions of people around the world who want to hear about this You want to tune in. That's right. Right. But enough of this looking back. We're going to look forward. And I want to talk about a story that I'm going to be watching for 2023, and that is the negotiations over the Farm Bill. And we have talked on this show pretty regularly about how and whether the government can do things to help farmers, to encourage farmers, to have incentives for farmers to do more in the way of climate smart agriculture. And a lot of this is going to play out in the farm bill. And to see this new, this incoming um, House and how especially the Republicans who have not been particularly friendly to climate smart incentives are going to think about this in the negotiations is something I've got my eye on. So I will, as usual, push back a little since I think Republicans, in fact, will not be that wild about this climate smart agriculture stuff. And in fact, the incoming House Agriculture Chairman has already said that he wants to hold hearings to look into it um, because he thinks it's kind of bogus. Um, and honestly, I would be shocked if they actually get their act together and do a farm bill in 2023. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll I'll be saying the same thing <laughs> in 2024. Oh, yes. watch the farm bill negotiations. <laughs> exactly. So what I'm going to watch in 2023 is this whole concept of carbon markets. Feels like it might be finally arriving to have its moment. Um, and it's really important, right? I think there's been all kinds of criticisms of these offsets that, uh, you know, paying people to uh, to reduce their emissions. Um, they're all kind of, you got to monitor it. You got to verify it. Uh, there are all kinds of fishy stuff out there. But I feel like carbon markets are sort of the worst solution to these problems except for all the others. And they really are starting to get some momentum. I think a big question is whether you've seen the election of Lula in Brazil, um, a huge opportunity to pour billions of dollars in climate finance through these carbon markets, as you see airlines and oil companies and others who want to offset their emissions. Um, but Lula, as a socialist, is very skeptical of these markets. I think it'll be interesting to see what he does with that. And then even here in the United States, you're really starting to see a bunch of private companies and public or nonprofit markets kind of reaching critical mass where they're really going to start selling these credits. And it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out. We've talked about, you know, are these credits going to be for the right kind of things? Are they going to be paying farmers for things that actually reduce emissions? Um, are you going to be paying people to protect forests that then burn down? Um, are you going to pay for soil carbon that can't then be monitored? And we're seeing new startups that are popping up. And Al Gore even has a nonprofit that's actually going to work on, on monitoring and verifying this stuff. I just think it's going to be a really interesting area to watch in 2023. And you know, if we're going to actually fix these agricultural emissions, I think there's got to be some incentives. And if you got a better place to find lots of money than the, you know, the global, <laughs> the global capitalist markets, you know, that would be great. So I'm watching the farm bill. You're watching Brazil and carbon offsets. 
And we, we, we talked beforehand and we both have a prediction for 2023 and a challenge for 2023. But we're going to get to those at the end. Right. I can't believe we're only doing this for the second time because it's our favorite thing to do. We are doing a mailbag. We, you guys send us so many great questions on voicemail, on email, and we want to answer them. So we want to get into your questions about plastics, about local food, about grass-fed beef, and of course, about bugs, particularly crickets, because everybody wants to know about that stuff. So I am Michael Grunwald. And I am Tamar Haspel, and this is the new, improved 2023 version of Climavores, a show about eating on a changing planet. COVID, reproductive rights, staggering medical debt. Health policy is in the news like never before. Hi, I'm Julie Rovner, Chief Washington Correspondent at Kaiser Health News and host of the podcast KHN's What the Health. Every week, top reporters from outlets including The New York Times, Politico, and CNN join me to discuss the latest health and health policy news. Confused by all the health policy jargon? We'll break it down in terms that are easy to understand. KHN's What the Health. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, my name is Robin, and I'm such a huge fan of the podcast. I've been listening since, I think, episode two. But I have always been pretty curious, and, you know, a lot of food these days are packaged in plastic, which is pretty bad for the environment. But I just wanted to know, like, is what what's your take on it? Is, does it have that big of an impact, or should we just go vegetarian and or vegetarian or vegan and not think another second about it. Um, again, I love the show so much. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Tamar and Mike. This is Joe from Maryland. I want to know, what is the deal with paper straws? Um, paper straws instead of plastic straws. So why is it that so many places now have paper straws, even if your cup is entirely made out of plastic? I would curious your guys thoughts and what what is going on with this thanks hi mike and tamar my name is abby and i have a question about packaging i am wondering if all of my bulk bags and attention to not buying plastic is actually making a difference with my carbon footprint thank you bye so three questions about plastics and honestly we got way more than three Everybody wants to know about plastics. It's a really interesting issue. And in some ways, it's really simple, right? For, for those questions, like plastic straws or paper straws, well, why don't you not use a straw? Um, you know, plastic forks or biodegradable forks, just use your metal fork that you have at home. And when it's paper or plastic bags, use that reusable bag that you can bring to the store every time. And that's going to be better than using lots of bags. And, you know, so many of these questions we get take the same sort of format. How much better is the climate-friendly version of the utensil or the bag or the straw? How much better is that than the plastic utensil or straw? And the answer is what you just said, that that using le- not using something, using less of something is always better than using the climate-friendly version of whatever it is. That's always the easy answer. But there's a harder answer, too, and we're not going to gloss over that. Right. Well, well for one thing, I mean, the, they're like the climate-friendly alternative is not necessarily always climate-friendly, right? And I do think, look, first, I think up front, a lot of these are math problems that we haven't done all the math. Like, we need to do more research. So I think we should commit that at some point we're going to do a whole episode about plastics, about recycling, about packaging, about the straws and bags and utensils and everything. But I will just say that, you know, take the, the classic paper versus plastic when you're, uh, when you're at the grocery store, right? And we've been told over and over again, you know, plastic is bad and it is bad. Uh, a lot of you're starting to see some cities are actually taxing the plastic bag to encourage you to use paper. And it's true. You see like these gigantic 
clumps of plastic in the middle of the ocean. It's horrible. They tell you it'll, you know, it'll be there for a thousand years. This stuff never biodegrades. But remember, we're we're climavores. And the thing about that stuff not biodegrading, it's like storing the carbon. It's not while your biodegradable fork or your paper bag, you know, that's pretty much going to degrade and put the carbon back in the atmosphere, which is what we're trying to avoid. So obviously plastic, you know, it's a petroleum product. It has a lot of emissions when you make it. I'm just saying these are really complicated questions. Okay, but I also don't want people going out and saying, oh, Tamar and Mike say that plastic pollution is just another form of carbon sequestration. (laughs) Yeah, right, right. Well, it certainly is sequestering it for a very long time. (laughs) And, And the thing about biodegradables is is important because it actually really depends on how they biodegrade. If they get put in compost, and so many of these are compostable, that's their reason for being, if they get put in compost and they actually break down in that way and turn into compost, which then gets returned to somebody's food-growing enterprise, and if you have extra, I always need more, then that's a good thing. But if the compostables go in the landfill, they break down in a different way. And so landfills emit nitrous oxide, they emit methane, and compost piles emit way fewer greenhouse gases. And it's mostly, it's it's more CO2, which is less dangerous than nitrous oxide and methane. Um, but those microbes uh, that make methane don't really work in the presence of oxygen, and you have oxygen in your compost pile most of the time. So the biodegradable thing, the advantage of it really depends on how it gets biodegraded. And in general, I think we can say single-use plastics really are as bad as everybody says. Yes. But single-use anything has an impact. So let's try to reuse, try to recycle, and if you can, don't use. And, you know, there's this is part of sort of a bigger conversation. And when when the plastic straw brouhaha hit the airwaves, what was that, a couple years ago? Yeah, how did we miss and, that in our culture war issue? <laughs> I know, we should have. <laughs> and lots of people were saying, yes, plastic straws are the devil. And then a lot of people were putting it in context and saying, okay, yeah, plastic straws are not so great, but let's put this in 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 place in the larger picture. And the thing about plastic straws being bad is true. And the thing about plastic straws being small is also true. And we get into this conversation a lot about, okay, yeah, here's this thing that's true but small. So why are we talking about this thing that's true but small? But if that were the case, we'd have you know, we'd have two episodes, one on eating less beef and one on wasting less food, and then there wouldn't be anything else to talk about. Because a lot of the issues that we talk about are small, but small issues add up if you do a lot of it and everybody else you know starts doing a lot of it and the aggregate impact is significant. And so I remember when the straw thing hit, I happened to have a box of plastic straws in my house. And now I'm like, saving them and washing them because I know I'm never buying plastic straws again. (laughs) And and so I'm reusing. And, you know, again, if this mindset takes hold, and and I I think actually not using single-use plastics is probably the biggest change I've made over the last few years at home. And because it, it got my attention. And, you know, if these things take hold and become part of the zeitgeist, then they can make a meaningful impact. And so that's why we talk about them. I think that's right. You can, uh, like, certainly my bigger changes I've made is I put solar panels on my roof. We, My wife and I got electric cars. I've now stopped eating beef. You're making me feel like a putz here, and mine is plastic bags. <laughs> well, but, you know, when it, plastic bags is a start, and then you go to plastics, right? And so these things do add up. Uh, you know, we make a bazillion decisions a day. So the more that are climate friendly, the better. So we got through that without making the Mrs. Robinson joke. (laughs) Hey, it's Spencer from Hutchinson, Kansas. I have celiac through, so no wheat for me. Yes, I've heard all the jokes about living in Kansas and not being able to eat wheat. I guess I'm just interested in an episode similar to your milk alternatives in how do the Gluten-free grain options compare with the standard cereal crops, you know, wheat, oats, and barley. And then how do the 
gluten-free grains compare to each other. I'm really interested in that. And again, love your show. Thanks so much for it. Bye. Spencer, you're totally right that there's a certain irony in a guy from Kansas having celiac disease because, you know, Kansas is our breadbasket, acres and acres and acres and acres of wheat fields. Um, and the, but the question about gluten-free grains is an excellent one. And it comes down to something that we talk about all the time. The main impact that these kinds of crops have is pegged back to their yield, because the less land they can use to grow more food, the smaller their impact. And uh, and oats, which are the biggest grain crop that are gluten-free, and for the record, oats are gluten-free, um, but they're often processed in facilities that also process grains that have gluten. And so that's why you see uh, gluten-free oats in the market and then also oats that are not marked as gluten-free. And if you have a gluten intolerance, chances are that's not enough gluten to trigger any bad reactions. But if you're celiac and you have to be super careful, then then you have to find the ones that say gluten-free on the label because they're processed so that they don't get cross-contaminated. But oats are a great substitute for wheat. And their climate impact is, their yield isn't quite as much as wheat. It's about two thirds that of wheat. But because these grains do produce so much food um, in, in a relatively small area of land, I don't think you really have to worry about that because these are way better than any of the animal products and most of the fruits and vegetables that are out there. So uh, a diet where uh, grains, and if you're looking at health impact, uh, whole grains are are the backbone. Is a climate friendly diet, right? And uh, I think again, we talk about yield all the time. It really is a big difference, though, when you're you know when you have two thirds of the, of the yield. That means you're going to need basically you know another fifty percent more land exactly. to make the same same amount of food, and that that adds up when you're talking about these massive amounts of land. Now, again, oats, we don't grow that much in uh, in this country anymore. Not anymore. We used to grow tens of millions and feed them to our horses, which were our main form of transportation, as well as, and farm labor. And uh, technology replaced that. Um, now we have a more efficient, we use, we use corn. Uh, we've come full circle. We're now putting 40 million acres worth of corn into our cars uh, to run them in the form of ethanol. It would be awesome. We actually don't eat most of our grain in this country anymore. We either put them into, into our cars or into our farm animals, um, and then we eat them. But obviously, you know, if you can just eat grain, um, you're ahead of the game, whether you're eating something with gluten or without. But the yield question also comes in to the conversation when we talk about um, having more diverse rotations, growing more different kinds of grain. Because, of course, the grains that we grow all the time in this country, wheat, oats, and to some extent sorghum, um, uh, are the ones that people have put effort into making high-yielding varieties. And there's so many other grains, you know, millet and teff, that haven't had that work put into them. And so when we, like, it again, it's, it's all trade-offs all the time. It's great to have complex rotations, but when you rotate in a grain that has lower yields than the grain you're rotating out, there's a land trade-off. And it's hard to weigh those things. To go back to Spencer's original question, Spencer, you're good. The oats are fine. And if, if uh, you want uh, gluten-free options that really do have a lower climate impact than wheat, go to corn, go to potatoes. Those are two of the most high-yielding crops and gluten-free. Hi, Tamara and Mike. Uh, this is Ashley from Southwest Virginia. Uh, big, big fan of your pod. Thanks for all the work you do. Uh, the question I wanted to bring you is about precision agriculture. Um, to me, as sort of a layman hobbyist, uh, precision ag feels like this amazing win-win opportunity. You know, it feels like it has the potential to both increase yields while decreasing land use. It just feels like there's a lot of potential there. Uh, so my question for you guys is sort of how much there is there um, and how much capacity would that have to 
impact the overall climate impact of the agriculture industry. Uh, I'd be really interested to hear your insights. So uh, thanks for considering, and uh, I'll continue to be a dedicated listener. Thanks a lot. Bye. Ashley, that's an amazing question. And uh, and yes, uh, Precision Ag is a win, 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 win. We love Precision Ag um, because, as you said, it can mean more output and less input, which is kind of what we're going for when we when we talk about agriculture, right? And you see these incredible self-driving tractors that are programmed with artificial intelligence and satellite data so they know exactly where in their fields to drop the fertilizer and the pesticides. Um, you've got drones, uh, you've got smart irrigation. Uh, it's just an amazing, brave new world. I was in a... a Tel Aviv skyscraper. Um, and I visited this company. Uh, they were then called Prospera Ag. They've been sold for a few hundred million dollars, but they called themselves the uh, the data wizards in muddy boots. And they kind of, they had, uh, they used the internet of things. So they had sensors all over pivot irrigation systems in Nebraska. Um, and then they used artificial intelligence to see what those sensors were seeing. Um, and I was talking to this data engineer and he suddenly got a text on his phone and it was from one of those pivot irrigation systems in Nebraska, and it was an aphid. It was like one-eighth of an inch. Um, and then it sent him a picture and the farmer a picture. And basically, it was like saying, spray here. Um, and that is an amazing way to, first of all, reduce for a farmer the amount of, you know, not just the amount that they're spending on their inputs, inputs but the, on their pesticides, on their on their water, on their fertilizer, but to reduce their impact on the land and on the climate. Uh, so that's amazing. And of course, you know, by fertilizing where they really need it, they can increase their yields, make more food, which means less land, which saves the Amazon. And that's what we talk about here on Climavores. So this is such a clear win because it's a climate win and a farmer win. And I know you've been traveling in these circles a lot. So what do we know about the extent to which this has been adopted by farmers? Because you'd think they'd be crawling all over each other to do it. And what are the barriers for people who haven't adopted it? Sure. I mean, the, the short answer is that in the, in the rich world, particularly, the big farmers mostly have at least some of it. And uh, the small farmers in the rich world and all farmers – in the poor world do not have it, um, or at least do not have the kind of stuff I've been talking about, right? You can you can see they're starting to try to get like better weather reports to the developing world. And that makes a big difference if you're a, you know, if you're a farmer in the Congo. Um, but in general, sort of the more money, the bigger farms, the more likely you are to invest in these often expensive technologies that do require an outlay and then pay off relatively quickly. I think that this feeds into what I think is one of the central divides in the food movement because there's there so much of the good food movement is focused on smaller farms, diverse farms, vegetable farms, organic farms. There's, I want to use the word sort of visceral um, repugnance for these large farms that are technology driven. And you know, as someone who's ran a small farm for over a dozen years and and didn't have the economies of scale to have any of the machinery that makes farming easier, I sort of gained a firsthand appreciation for big farms because it's big farms that can have the machinery that offload that offloads the back breaking labor. It's the big farms that can afford these tools to do things that benefit the the soil, the climate. And of course, they can also afford tools that just makes things easier for them and doesn't benefit the 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 soil or the climate. But in this case, I think there's there's a, it's a very real illustration of why farms get bigger. Right, right. And I do think, you know, I think it's unfortunate that there is some people do kind of turn up their nose at technology and say that's not real farming or that's like industrial ag. And it is industrial ag. Yeah, this is the good thing about industry, right? We use like industry as a as a kind of good word in some in some senses and like, you know, wasting less water, you know, 
better nitrogen use efficiency sounds incredibly dorky, but that means like you're putting more of your nitrogen into your crop so that it grows better and less of your nitrogen into the lake or the Gulf of Mexico or your streams um, or the air so you're not messing up the environment and the climate. So I think, you know, there's no reason an organic farm, for instance, can't have a lot of this excellent technology. Um, and ultimately, you know, through things like, you know, you talk about kind of Uber for tractors and, uh, you know, these various ways to share technology, you hope that smaller farmers will get more access to these things that can reduce their backbreaking labor, as you said, but also their impact on the land. And, you know, I think what we can hope for here is that adoption and refinement makes these things cheaper and more people can have them for more situations because as you started off saying, precision ag is just a clear win for everybody. Exactly. And when we talk about climate smart agriculture, there's such a, you know, immediately people are thinking like, oh, well, how can we store more carbon in the soil? And great if you can do it. But if you can Im improve your yields, that is climate smart too. And so precision agriculture ought to be a part of this climate smart thinking. Hey guys, this is Joe from Maryland. Um, I love the podcast and I had a question um, related to an email I got from one of the major um, nonprofits that does a lot to protect the Chesapeake Bay, uh, the water quality and the environment there. And they sent an email out promoting a grass-fed beef farm, a local one, saying why grass-fed beef? Pasture-raised meats are climate-friendly and improve soil health. So my question for you guys, is it actually good for the environment to eat grass-fed meat? Is it even better than traditional meat, um, traditional beef that would be obviously fed corn and go through those other type of processes? So I'm curious your guys' thoughts on this email um, and whether it's true or not. Thanks. Bye. Joe from Maryland, I'm so glad you asked about grass-fed meat because I just wrote a column about grass-fed beef. Because here's sort of the central issue. And up top when we were talking about plastics, we were talking about things that are true but small. And I think there are lots of times that the conversation about grass-fed beef misses this part of it. It's absolutely true that cattle... Uh, can improve soil health. And they do it in a couple of ways. Of course, where they eat, they poop, and the poop can then fertilize the ground. But also, uh, when they eat certain kinds of grasses, it encourages biodiversity. The action of their hooves encourages root growth. There are lots of ways that cattle can improve soil. And, you know, sometimes it's a little bit hard because it improves soil in a couple of ways that don't really are, are measured in different ways. Biodiversity is important, but it's different from carbon sequestration. And so carbon sequestration is what grass-fed advocates are promoting because, of course, carbon in the form of methane is the problem with beef as we go on and on, on about on this show. So the question isn't, can cattle sequester carbon? They can. The question is, how much carbon and how easy is it to get them to sequester carbon? And if you look at the studies that actually measure what cattle can, can sequester, here's what you find. They can actually sequester a fair amount. Um, they can sequester enough to offset a good chunk of their methane uh, emissions, although that doesn't take into account deforestation. But the problem is that in order to graze that way, they need twice as much land. And hey, Mike, is land important? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to pick on Joe from Maryland. Don't um, pick on Joe from Maryland. <laughs> well, he said that his, his cows are good for the environment. And I'm sorry, Joe, your cows are not good for the environment. <laughs> um, <laughs> cows just aren't. Now, again, I'm, people want beef, so people are going to raise cattle. Um, that, is, that is just a fact. Um, but we shouldn't pretend that it is good for the environment because they have a gigantic impact. Um, Corn-fed and grass-fed. And in many ways, grass-fed can be even worse. Um, now, this is partly 
because the methane, which uh, which Tamar did mention. Now, if you're burping and farting methane into the atmosphere, now uh, when you do corn-fed beef, you're taking them off the land and you're just basically shoving corn down their gullet for a couple months, but it reduces as much of a year the amount of time that that cow is alive, burping and farting out on the grass. And so that does reduce some of those methane emissions. But the real problem, as Tamar mentioned, is land. Um, It is just cows are incredibly inefficient ways to convert their nutrition into our nutrition. It can take as much as 40 calories of grass or or grain uh, that you put into a cow to get one calorie of beef for us. And this is why cattle take up really about a third of the earth's land now. And this is why cattle are the leading source of deforestation in the Amazon. Um, it is, you can, there are things you can do and it's going to be very important that we do them to increase their, you know, the, their density on the land so that you can grow more beef with less land, um, to reduce their methane emissions, whether that's through, you know, these kind of feed additives like seaweed that we've been hearing about. Um, and if it's possible to store more carbon in pastures, the best way to do that seems to be growing trees on the pasture. Um, but if there are other ways through rotational grazing, that can be really helpful. But we just can't sugarcoat this. You know, cows are an environmental problem and they're not going to become an environmental solution. We can just reduce the amount of the problem. So, Mike, when was the last time anyone accused you of sugar sugarcoating something? <laughs> so this is this that but there's like a there's a clash here because cattle on pasture, cattle incorporated into crop raising um, farms. Uh, it cattle doing the thing that cattle do, which is graze, is appealing on so many levels. It's appealing on an animal welfare level. It's appealing on a biodiversity level. Um, it's appealing as 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 our gut sense of how food should be grown. Um, but one of the difficulties of being in this in th- these chairs that Mike and I are in of trying to to trying to figure out the real climate impact of these things is that the math often contradicts the things that we feel. And, you know, Mike and I are math people and we definitely come down on the side of the math, but I see the advantages of cattle on, on grass. I see that these Cattle are doing the things that cattle do, and and I, I'm not writing that off. But there's just no way around the fact that grass-fed beef is a climate loser. Yeah, to, to beat a dead cow a little bit. Um, let's just take biodiversity, which it is true. There are ways that you can graze cattle that are better for the biodiversity of that particular land where they are grazing. Mm -hmm. But cattle are a biodiversity disaster. Um, There's a reason that right now the world's livestock weigh 15 times more than the world's wild animals. And a lot of it is because cattle has replaced nature all over the world. And it's a real problem. Okay, but speaking of grazing, we got another grazing question. So let's go to that one. Hi, I'm Daniel. You talked about how much cattle ranching contributes to deforestation and climate change. I'm wondering if other ruminants have the same effects. Is eating lamb and goat just as bad because they are also methane producers? Or are they better because, for instance, lambs live shorter lives? Thank you. Daniel, thanks for asking that question, and not just because I am a lamb eater, I will confess. Um, it's a great question because, of course, sheep and goats are also ruminants and they emit methane. So uh, to answer your question, I turn to the source that I almost always turn to when I want to figure out the climate impact of food. And everybody should have our world in data on virtual speed dial because it breaks down the best sources of information in ways that that are interesting and easy to understand, and you can customize them yourself to see what you want. 
And one of the people who works there who does a lot of this work is Hannah Ritchie. And if you're on Twitter, you should follow her. She's wonderful. She's smart. She cares about these issues profoundly. And I checked in with her on this because in our world and data, you can see that a pound of beef, well, they do it by kilograms. A kilogram of beef is a kilogram, is 100 kilograms of of CO2 equivalent. And about half of that comes from methane, and the other half comes from a combination of on-farm stuff and, and, and other manure issues and deforestation, which, of course, we've talked about ad nauseum. So that's 100 kilograms per kilogram for beef, but for lamb and goat, it's only 40 kilograms per kilogram of beef, of, of, of meat. So we had a conversation about, well, why is that? And one of the reasons you hit on, Daniel, which is that uh, the lambs don't live very long, so they're not out in the world uh, uh, burping methane as long. But it turns out that sheep and goats are better converters of feed. So they just, they eat less to produce one kilogram of meat, and so they emit less methane to produce one kilogram of meat. So... And I've also been told by, and this is not my area of expertise, that sheep and goats can graze on much more marginal land than cattle can, which is another plus. But there's one other element of this that I think is really interesting, but maybe it's just because I'm kind of a geek, is that one of the reasons uh, the cost of beef is so high is that a cow only has one calf in a year. So if you're looking at the method of the climate impact of that calf, once it becomes beef, you have to include the methane from an entire year of the mother. But sheep often have twins. They sometimes have triplets. And goats have lots of kids. So you have to amortize the methane of the mother over more animals, which decreases the cost. I'm, I have to say this. This is another reason why I believe the pig is the ultimate eating animal. Because a sow, um, who and pigs, of course, are not ruminants. They're what are called monogastrics. So they do not emit methane as a byproduct of the, their digestion. And a sow can have 20 piglets in a year, so her uh, greenhouse impact gets amortized over many more animals. And this is one of the reasons that pork is so much better than all of the ruminants. And even though lamb and goat is way better than beef, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say it's still bad. So uh, I do eat lamb. I don't eat it very often. Um, and I actually, I do, I buy a half a lamb from people who do grass fed lamb in my, uh, local area. And so, uh, this is, these, these are all the hot buttons we're talking about that aren't, you know, they're not as good as you think they are, but there's room for some of that in everybody's diet. You, not every meal has to be optimized for climate. Of course, I have at least tried I have now a few months of no beef and no lamb. Uh, now it's I'm I'm trying good. to tell myself like, huh, if it's you know if it's only forty percent as bad, maybe I can bring back the lamb. Have a little bit, <laughs> but uh, but no. Um, but I will say that uh, you know a lot of people told me, oh, you know, you can cut it out. You won't even miss it. I miss it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marty. And I am 76 years old, and I just finished listening to bonus episode, Climavores, Bursting the Eat Local Bubble. Um, I enjoyed the episode, and I appreciated uh, the various points of view. One thing that I think was left out of the value of local farming and farms is that there is knowledge in farming and farmers. And um, that knowledge is going away. So that's just an angle that I have. Uh, my son is a goat farmer, his wife too, uh, and their their son, my grandson, who's almost 13, he's uh, following in their footsteps with um, farming. Uh, I enjoyed uh, your podcast. I've subscribed and I'll listen some more. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.
Marty, thank you so much for your question. That is, uh, you know, we're still here. We got a ton of questions about local food too, and we still hear about it all the time. It was what our second episode, I think. And you pissed <laughs> and, a lot of people off. I did when I said that thing about how going to the farmers market is like, uh, is you know, it's like the left wing version of going to a NASCAR. Yeah, uh, making race friends wherever you go. But I, but you know, first of all. I meant it in a good way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do. Uh, I think like it really, I like going to the farmer's market. It is fun. And then NASCAR is also fun. Um, but it is a way for kind of like-minded people to do a like-minded thing and feel kind of good about it. Um, Marty is getting at another sort of kind of ineffable benefit of the farmer's market of local food, um, which is that if you go, if you're around food, if you're around farmers, you might learn from them. And that is true. I think one thing we talked about in that original episode is that there's a, a little bit of a myth of going to the farmer's market that then you know where your food is coming from. But usually you're not at the farm. You're just, uh, you know, and as I think I mentioned that at my farmer's market in, in Miami, we get, you know, we get strawberries from California, which is kind of weird. Um, but I do think to the extent that it's true, to the extent that you can meet farmers and learn about where your food comes from, that is a good thing, right? Uh, this used to be an agrarian nation where everybody grew their food. Um, and now there are only 2 million farmers out of the 350 million of us. They grow the food so that the rest of us can do podcasts and write newspaper stories and whatever it is that all the rest of you do. Um, so I think it is worth, I think Marty has absolutely seized on something that is true, that uh, we can learn something from from local farmers and from local food. I think we do have to reiterate again that the idea that it's great for the climate is bogus. Um, the idea that it's great for the environment is bogus. Um, and uh, there is a slight advantage of growing, of food that doesn't travel long distances, particularly if it doesn't fly. That can be a, a big a big difference. But for the most part, what matters is what you eat and not where it comes from. So this, there's a little bit of a difference of opinion between Mike and me because it, well, not so much a difference of opinion, but a difference of emphasis because he is certainly correct about, uh, the, the climate impact. Um, I see more value in what Mike calls the ineffable advantages. But Mike, Marty also mentioned the, the transference of knowledge from farmer to farmer. And as a farmer who has benefited from that, I see that in spades. Um, my husband and I have had an oyster farm for, you know, a dozen years. And we learned everything we know about oyster farming from the other farmers in our area. There's no manual. And farming is even more local than politics. And to be able to learn from people who are in your area and trying to make a living, if you're doing any kind of farming, is a real value. But of course, it's only a value if you value agriculture in the community. And, you know, I'll say this every time, I value agriculture in the community. I value the open spaces. I value the that consumers can see where food comes from and sort of internalize the idea that somebody has to do a lot of work in order for us to eat. I value the farmer's market as a community touchstone. I value the fact that you can bring a kid to a place to meet a pig. Um, and because of all of that, I think that Marty has touched on a couple of things that, that, that play a role in all of those things. And so I am not anti-local, despite the fact that it is not a climate win. Yeah, I think Tamar has accurately um, portrayed our disagreement and that it is a question of how much you value it. Um, like, what is food for? And I think it's less for the, the farmer than for the eater, to be honest, um, though we do owe a debt to our, our farmers um, and they should be paid properly. Um, you know, what I think the big issue with farming right now is that it's responsible for the worst mass extinction we've had since the asteroid that uh, that wiped out the di dinosaurs, and that it is a third of our climate problem, um, which is probably the biggest threat to humanity right now. And I think that's what we kind of have to deal with, um, and local food makes that worse. 
the other, I'm not saying that the other values aren't values. I'm just saying that to me, they're not as high a value. And, you know, I don't see this gap closing anytime soon. But uh, that is the rundown of the questions that that we can shoehorn into one episode, although there's still a few out there that we would like to address in a future episode, but we need more questions to come in to do more mailbag episodes. And because it's our favorite thing, we hope you will continue to do it. But before we let you go, uh, for 2023, we thought that we would both make a prediction of something that'll happen in this year. Mike, what's yours? Well, I think, you know, we've talked so much about plant-based meat, right? Impossible foods, beyond meat. Um, Now you're starting to see a bunch of other entrants. And of course, it's taking a huge beating because sales have been flat, right? We had this incredible boom in 2019, right? Where beyond meat, um, had the biggest IPO in a decade. I think it started at 20 and it immediately went up to like $235 a share. Um, impossible. The Whopper was in all the Burger Kings. People said this was going to completely change the world. And now there's, there's a, it's not happening so much. Um, but I was just out in Silicon Valley where people talk a lot about the Gartner hype cycle right, for emerging technologies. And basically when, you know, you see some new innovation, right, and suddenly everybody goes crazy about it like they did for Beyond and for plant-based meat generally, and they call that the peak of inflated expectations. The hype gets out of control. And then, right, and we're in, we are now in the trough of disillusionment. Um, sometimes uh, I think America has been in the trough of disillusionment for a while. Um, but the idea is that at some point, then you get onto the slope of enlightenment, right? You know, pets.com did not accurately reflect the prospects of the internet. And I think this current trough does not, you know, we, sh- we shouldn't assume that plant-based meat is dead because it's having a bit of a tough time right now. Uh, Beyond Meat, I know, is going to come out with a new burger um, that they say is going to be a lot better. Um, I think you're starting to see a lot of new entrants. When I was out there, I had some delicious uh, plant-based ice cream. I had some fungus-based turkey slices that tasted like turkey. I had a meatball with a little touch of animal fat that was otherwise plant-based that tastes great. And I really think you're going to see a comeback this year. It's not going to go back to that peak of inflated expectations, but I think this is going to be a product that people are going to like and they better like because... The planet kind of depends on it. Okay, you guys. So there you have it. The Grunwaldian uh, prediction for 2023 is the resurgence of plant-based meat. And I'm my prediction is that the ketogenic diet is headed for the trough of disillusion. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm calling 2022 as peak keto, and it's going to start to slide in 2023. And a good thing, too, because beef and leaf is the worst diet for the planet, and I will be glad to see the back of keto. Although I'll add that if it works for you and it makes you help achieve your weight loss goals and feel good, power to you, I would just like to see it lose its th- this idea that this is some you know no-brainer solution to what ails us. And up front, I promised you a challenge for 2023. It's a challenge that Mike and I are both taking on, and I hope you'll take it on with us. And that is to find something to change your mind about. Now, those of you who read my stuff or have listened to me here know that I'm really big on mind changing. And I think the list of things that you change your mind about is sort of a badge of open-mindedness and and a willingness to re-examine your own priors, which I find very difficult to do, but I try really hard to do it. And so since we've been doing this podcast, I changed my mind about dairy, which was something that I I thought oat milk was <laughs> just for Brooklyn hipsters. But, uh, but Mike convinced me that it's something that I should be including in my rotation. I haven't given up dairy entirely. I still put cream in my coffee, but oat milk is definitely in the rotation. And Mike, I know there were a few things you changed your mind about. Well, and they were all because of you, which is, I don't know if that means that I like, I have bad ideas and you're always correcting me or just I'm like an incredibly open-minded dude. 
<laughs> Hard to say. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the obvious one is lentils, which, uh, <laughs> you know, I thought were, uh, you, know, you know, bird food. And uh, now I realize are just about as awesome as you say. Almost um, as awesome. Uh, you know, one thing that I, I remember changing my mind about is, uh, and, we, and I didn't mention it when we talked about uh, cell-based or cultivated meat last uh, last week, um, is this uh, this whole question of what to call that stuff. Because I used to think, you know, there was a time when the Good Food Institute and others who were really pushing this stuff were they were calling it clean meat. Um, the idea is the echo of clean energy and it's, you know, no antibiotics, uh, no E. coli, you know, no growth hormones, right. um, and, you know, no massive impact on the climate. So it's just like clean energy. It's, uh, it's clean meat. And they pulled back because basically the conventional meat industry went nuts and they're like, are you calling us dirty? And my feeling was like, yeah, calling you a little dirty. <laughs> um, and that's, uh, and that's what you get. Um, and people in the industry said, no, we have to work with these guys. Uh, Cargill has invested in Upside, so has Tyson, um, that the best way to get this stuff distributed, um, ultimately that they have the infrastructure, they have the power, they have the, the money to get, make this stuff happen around the world, and we don't want to antagonize it, them, so we're going to call it cultivated meat. And um, at the time, I thought that was just kind of wimpy. But I've come around to their way of thinking. I think, you know, well, I'll go with cultivated from now on. So there you have it, the open-mindedness of Mike Grunewald. And we are going to try and continue to do that. And we are going to challenge you to try and find something that you are going to change your mind about in 2023. And of course, one of the ways you can do that is to continue listening to Climavores. So I hope you'll stick with us for this year. Climavores is a production of Postscript Media. And because we do the mailbag episode as often as we can, we want to hear from you. So let us know what you're thinking, what you want to know. Call us at 508-377-3449 or send us an email at climavores at postscriptaudio.com. The show is hosted by me, Tamar Haspel. And me, Michael Grunwald. Executive producers are Scott Clavenna and Stephen Lacey. Senior editor is Ann Bailey. Managing producer is Cecily Mesa Martinez, and Dalvin Abawaje is the associate producer. Engineering by Sean Marquin and Greg Vilfrong. Postscript Media is supported by Prelude Ventures, a venture capital firm focused on climate solutions across energy, food, agriculture, transportation, logistics, and advanced materials. We're so grateful that you listened to us in 2022, and we hope you will keep doing it in 2023. And maybe even tell your friends. Spread the word. Give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We're also streaming on Amazon Music. We appreciate your listening, and we hope you'll pass on a link. And we'll see you next week. Bye.